Right, so welcome to the second part of the visual brain in the cortex, explaining what happens a little bit about the visual stimuli in the cortex and a little bit about the cortex as well. We're going to, I'm trying to um, motivate maybe a research program, it's called the Blue Brain, which we're going to watch a video later on. And then there are just two uh, exercises for you to do uh, that I help you with to understand what object formation in the brain visual object formation that is how that works so to catch up we we talked last week about how light enters the retina the eye gets scattered onto the retina gets translated into neural impulses hello uh, we talked about receptive fields remember the receptive fields i hope that you understand them a little bit better after the exercise with the pluses in the middle and the minus on outside or maybe the other way around we'll see them again today and um, then it all became a bit fuzzy because it ended up, or it, it, it then get went into the LGN, the lateral genital body, and into the cortex. And this is where we pick up the story today. Uh, the, maybe going back a little bit into evolution again, what vision actually has been developed for, presumably, is very simple, namely catching prey, or, well, to uh, analyze um, same as auditory really to find out if something outside is bigger than me in which case I flee or if it's smaller than me in which case I eat it <laughs> very basic principle uh, maybe a bit oversimplified but the visual system is, is, is quite good for that it doesn't need very much work namely if you have a representation in this case here on a on a reptile um, if you have a representation of the outside world of the retina, a retinotopic representation, you can use that in order to know where the insect is and to catch it. Fair enough. That, that solves a lot of questions um, and the way that it is done is well understood and it really um, is still preserved in us humans. So if we have the retinotopic map, here's our two eyes. Uh, you remember you've got the, the, the reverse of each um, outside field on the, on the retina then they are crossed and you've got on the receptive fields the two receptive fields are mirrored here but you do have a retinotopic uh, projection which means every point that is here will be at one fixed point there and it has been shown hello long time ago already that this retinotopic map is correlated with the motor map in the um, in, in, in the in the ganglions that can be used as well. So the, the the retinotopic map in here, or the motor map in here, reflects exactly the angles of the receptor of the of the visual field of the animal outside. So in fact, what that means is, if you have a light point up here, you got a, a light point here, which gets to an activity here, which translates in there, and as a motor map, means that an eye will swivel towards that point. Very simple. This is effectively what the simplest of all reflexes, the oculomotor reflex, is pretty much doing. That you, you focus on one point, and when it changes, you will uh, change, uh, adapt your eyes towards that point. Superior colliculus, as S is, 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 is where, where all of that happens. Superior colliculus, the first station where they um, where they cross. The that, that's not enough for us though because we don't want to catch prey usually we want more than visual reflexes as human often we have to balance the desire to catch one object with a need to dodge another or choose with the varieties of objects with worth, most worth pursuing luckily we're not often in that situation um, but this, uh, making the point here that y your brain is a lot more than your superior colliculus or your LGN because you control what you see and you make decisions in fractions of seconds based on those retinal projections. So we need a lot more than the, th th than the, the thalamus and this is what the cortex is doing for us. Now how does it do that? Here's again a picture, I think I showed you that a couple of weeks ago already. The brain frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. This is where the vision happens. It's in general, it's always the opposite. So the eye is in front here, so the visual cortex is back there. The ears are here, so 
so the, vis the auditory cortex is on the other side back there um, but that's just a result of the crossing um, generally the cortex a um, little bit of information is about consists of the grey matter surrounding the deeper white matter that should be a repeat you remember most of that I hope the anato anatomical division of the cortex is um, explained by the four skull bones. So the, the main fissures is that one, the sylvian fissure here, and uh, we've got four skull bones. If you have a, 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 a baby, um, they're actually overlapping when they when they come out when they're born. The the you know the <laughs> you, 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 I've been there twice. <laughs> it's not a pretty sight, but the, you know what the biggest problem in birth is the size of the head's baby that is oh, I'm digressing but it's an interesting story you should have heard that do you know what the biggest problem with humans is is the upright gait it's because this has changed the dynamics or the anatomy fundamentally because the problem is that the baby pushes due to gravity outside yeah through the what's it called pelvic bones so there's a very fine line between the size of the pelvic bone and the size of the head of the baby. In fact, when the, when the baby grows too big, it can't get out anymore. This is why it's very crucial that they're born at 40, what is it, 48 weeks, and not two weeks later, because after that, there's a very, very high chance that people die. In fact, birth is the most dangerous part of the, of the life for both mother and child. Um, other animals, mammals, don't have that problem because they don't have the upright gait. So they don't have gravity working against them. They have gravity that doesn't matter. So the birth for a, for a cow, if you've ever seen one in a video maybe, is completely unproblematic. There's certainly no pain involved. But for humans, there's a lot of pain involved with the, with the mum, obviously, for the baby, presumably, as well. Because the skull bones, the, the head is the problem. You want to keep the baby in as long as you can because babies are very, very incapable of doing things. They cannot walk upright. Baby zebras, baby horses come out and stand up and they walk. Babies take 12 months out of the body to do that. Why am I saying that? Because the, the, the head is actually not fixed at the time of birth. The head, um, the, the skull bones are overlapping in a baby like that. So the, 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 the head is actually squished together to get it through the birth canal. And later on, the, 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 the bones then um, separate, and then they actually grow together. That's why they have the, <laughs> the self-destruct button at the top. The, 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 what's it called? The, where the four bones meet is a little, uh, about, about this size of part of the brain, uh, the, 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 the head where there is no bone for about three weeks. What's it called? Anybody know that? Soft spot, that's right, soft spot. Freaky, really. You don't want to think about that too much. But there we go. We all had it. We all survived somehow. Anyway, um, right. The divisions, f further divisions are the, the deep sulky, and if the sulkies are not so deep, they're called fissures or gy gyri. They're, they're the, 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 the uh, bulges, and oh, they're not so big, they're called lobules. Cortex covers the whole area, one and a half to four and a half millimeter thick, so on average about two millimeter. It makes up about 80% of the brain's weight. So this is where all the energy goes into the cortex, not so much the, 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 the brain stem that we were talking about so far. We have about 100,000 neurons per square millimeter. And um, yeah, that, that's basically what I want to tell you, because we've seen all of that. And the, 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 the cortex can be classified. That is old stuff, 100 years old. A guy called Broadman looked at the cytoarchitecture. architecture so you just look through a microscope and saw first of all that, that the cortex has six layers. We come back to that in a second. And you just saw that the, that the, the thickness of the cell types look different in different areas of the brain. And he made a map of just numbering maps. I think there are 47 different areas. Last one isn't even on here because it's behind the Sylvian fissure here. And um, they're all different in, time in terms of, 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 of the number of neurons that are there and the type of neurons. And it, it, that was long before there was any idea of the function of the brain. But it turned out later that these um, areas are actually very, very helpful to describe the function. Because it was discovered later that these areas, specifically a motor area, these areas are the... the, the um, the sensory areas 
and then what's what's here in front called the associate area every time you hear the word associate from a neuroscientist you know that means they don't have a clue what's actually happening so they say it's associated with something um, but the sensory area as well well this is the part that we kind of sort of understand the auditory area is here visual area is back there and the visual area is 17, 18, 19, the primary, secondary, tertiary, visual areas take up a lot of space of the brain. Okay, here's the, the, the top view, so I've got the left eye, right eye, um, the optic chiasm here in the, um, the LGN, that's the thalamus, and then we have the optic radiations going to the, to the cortex. So this is a repeat from last time, if you have the two uh, blue and, and left on the right, you've got actual this separated to the blue with the right and the left hemisphere um, in the cortex. Uh, that's quite a clever thing. Um, and what in, in terms of the Brockman areas then, where the primary visual cortex is here ends, so where the, the fibers from the LGN end, that's what's called primary visual cortex. On the side view here is number 17. If you cut it through, it goes a little bit further in. The, the terms primary and secondary, uh, you, you see in all, you see primary motor cortex, primary visual cortex, primary auditory cortex, that always means that is where the auditory or the sensory information arrives first. Secondary cortex means this is where it then goes. So it's first arriving here, then it goes to the secondary cortex. So there's no big magic in, 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 in that. Yes, all of these cortices, um, here's another view of that from the side, see so how this, this folding um, set already, I think I said, why, why, this, why the, the, the cortex is folded so much, you remember, why does it look like a walnut? to increase the surface area, yes. Cortex literally means surface, and um, if, we, if we unfold that, it would be the floor area of, I think, two and a half square meters. So the, the, the whole point of the, the cortex is that it is the surface, but the brain is a three-dimensional structure, so the, the task is to fold a two-dimensional structure, namely the cortex, into the three-dimensional uh, um, volume. If you do that, you end up with folds, and this is what we see here. Um, evolutionary, by the way, uh, going back <coughs> here, this looks, it's not meant to be <coughs> like that, but this actually looks like a cat's brain. If you look at a cat's brain, it hasn't got any folds. It only has the, 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 these two main fissures in here, uh, but no folding, because it doesn't need to, because it doesn't need, the, it hasn't got the, the complexity to, to, to need more surface area. And if you go to, to more intelligent animals, like pigs, for example, quite intelligent, they have a quite a number of these <coughs> um, folds. And then monkeys, bigger brain anyway, but also more folds. What is, who has the biggest brain in animal on the planet? What do you think? It's a trick question. Burp! <laughs> <laughs> yes, the blue whale, in fact, because it's the biggest animal. There's no magic to that. The, the, the human is, is stands out in a number of respects, but not in brain size. And the reason for that is that the brain size is mostly correlated with the, f with the, b with the size of the body. Because the more body you have, the more you represent, or you have to, to, to represent on the brain. So, you, so much the, you, you, your sensory cortex becomes huge, becomes massive. So a blue whale brain is, is, is about three times the size of a, of a human brain. That doesn't mean that they're three times more intelligent or anything, yeah? Because the c intelligence obviously doesn't come from the size. It comes from connectivity. Otherwise we would have a problem with, uh, with, with, with gender equality because female brains are smaller than male brains, which is a function of body size and not of intelligence, I can assure you. The most complex brains, by the way, for a number of measurements, is also not the human, the most complex brain is the dolphin. 
It's also bigger than the human's brains, but the dolphins are not necessarily there, about the same size as the human, but they do funky things with their brain that require a lot more brain function than us. And these things are echolocation underwater, which t obviously takes a lot of brain function. But their cortex is very thin. <coughs> but obviously we all have heard the stories, dolphins are actually quite intelligent as well. I think elephants also have bigger brains than, than humans. Anyway, um, right, retinotopic organization. So this is still a kind of a repeat from what's, what's going on last week. So if we, if we have our visual field here, dark green, blue, light green, dark blue, light blue, this is what is represented on the, uh, on, on the, on the retina. And the, the, the yellow dot is the, um, the, the, the fovea in the middle. The optical nerve just over-represents the yellow area, the fovea. So this just gives a pie chart of how much information is transmitted in there. Then it goes through the optic chiasm, and then after the chiasm in the LGN, it's separated into areas. So here we only have the green, here we only have the blue. And in the optical cortex down there now, we've got the representation of the fovea down here, and the, the, the more lateral fields um, to the sides. We do have yeah. still uh, the the retinotopy, which means um, everything which is close here is close there as well. And we'll see later on that this is a very useful principle as well. So, but what happens on the cortex? So this is the big question. That's the hundred thousand. In fact, that's the one billion dollar question. Um, and to introduce that, there's one really interesting experiment that um, done by a Japanese group a few years ago, 2008, and with a technique called fMRI, probably everybody has heard of that, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So people, it's not a fast method, that's the problem. People lie in a big machine, it's actually a medical procedure, but it can be used to measure blood flow, and it measures the blood flow uh, in the brain on a time scale of tens of seconds, five seconds maybe, something like that. And what it measures is that the, the oxygenation level of blood, and when blood is used by the brain, it, 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 it carries um, more, or this area carries more uh, hemoglobin, and that can be detected in the, in, the in, in the scanner. And what people have done here, they have, um, Miyawaki et al, have observed, they, they, they split the fMRI in, in voxels, about 1,500 of those, which are all about three cubic millimeter which seems small, but it's actually quite large because all of them still contain about a million neurons. But still, that's the kind of the resolution of the fMRI that's restricted by the magnetic field, and at some point there is an upper limit for this. We now have here at the university a 17 Tesla um, imaging system, which you cannot use on humans. In fact, you cannot use it on any living material because if you imply a, a, a magnetic field of that strength, uh, people will start hallucinating. It would actually induce electric activity into the brain. So the maximum that you can do is about five Tesla, and that's used for, magnet, uh, for, for, for medical purposes. But what you do, coming back to what's, what's actually happening here, is they, they show a, a, a very trivial picture to the people with a high contrast, and they record the activity, so the blood activity of all of these voxels in the, auditory, uh, the visual cortex, and it takes a while, if you look at these, uh, the, the time here, 3 minutes, 40, 46, 48, so it takes about 10 seconds after the picture was shown to the, to, the, to the subject until you see a representation of that. So what we've been shown here is, well, a number of things, but one thing is there's a retinotopy. The other thing is you can, apparently you can read minds. You can actually see, you can deduce what people see. And that's a two-way street, because if people dream, for example, their primary visual cortex is active. So everything that is represented in the visual cortex is perceived as, a, as, a, as something vision. And everything that we perceive as vision, like a dream, has a representation of the event. But don't worry, this is technique is, is miles away from um, from from actual mind reading because you, you, the, the the resolution is just technically not possible to do 
smaller than that. Yes. Is that what the noise is coming from around the outside of the uh, that's a good question where the noise there's uh, the, 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 the fascinating thing is that there is so little noise that's why it is a nature or a, 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 a neuron paper um, I don't know the answer the, the noise could be from anything because it is all not so straightforward as you think I mean the fascinating thing is that it does work not that there is so much because I, I think 98% of the people would have said before forget it it's not possible to do that um, but, but apparently it, it, it is uh, and I don't think that then there's more noise oh, are you referring to uh, the stuff around the, the white blots when there's flat blots yeah flat blots but there's always noise I mean if you just look at one of them it will fluctuate it has a standard deviation which is quite large but if, if, if there is a if there is a syst systematic representation here it will have a higher Whiter values here, but every pi pixel in itself is very noisy. Obviously, this is not a perfect. Um, and this is more of an of an experiment that makes people go ooh, rather than to show something deep scientific. But it does show the retinotop retinotoscopy, which is which is preserved because if this this wouldn't work if you don't have a retinotopic representation. Um, you can do fMRI also in hearing, which I find more interesting actually. This is a very old study. Um, we're not going to, to into detail with that, with, called with, with, with a thing called Broca and Wernicke area. You might have heard that, please. Um, but they, they, if you hear a word, then this part of your brain here, the auditory, primary auditory cortex, becomes active. If you see a word in the scanner, your visual cortex, unsurprisingly, becomes active. Um, if you speak a word, a different part of the area uh, 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 area here, it's called Wernicke area, becomes active. If you generate word without speaking it, a fourth area here in the prefrontal cortex, the association area, becomes active. So this is a really powerful method to localize where functions are. Um, but why, why I'm saying that, just to warm you up for the, for the mind reading part two, that's a 2012 paper. Um, where they did a very similar uh, thing, but more powerful, 84 years later, in the auditory cortex. What they did is use patients during surgery, don't know why they were in surgery, but they had open, open skull surgery, and they implanted a field of electrodes. These red dots here are actually electrodes. How many are they? 10 by 10, probably. And they are probably a few millimeters deep. Um, so and, ha and have several contact points, so there's a couple of thousands of, of electrodes um, which don't do harm, yeah? so the people agreed on that and pro presumably went through ethical approval. Um, that's quite scary because this is really close to mind reading, because the, with a couple of thousand of these electrodes in, in the situation, they were able well, to record the uh, results of the had some spoken words as a stimuli. They recorded a few thousand of these time um, courses. They made a model of that. Right? That had to be trained through something else. But they kept w would be able. They were able to reconstruct the spectrogram of the speech. So this is equivalent to the visual. The visual word that this would be uh, the cross of something that we just saw. In the auditory world. This is frequency. Um, and time. That's the, 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 the equivalent. But the, the, the neurons are doing a very similar thing. And we can, um, if we understand that right, we can reconstruct what people actually heard. And again, um, the visual, the auditory cortex is a little bit active if people are speaking words, obviously, but also if they, well, if you put it back here, if they generate words in their, in their head. So you could presumably, maybe 10 years time, put a few electrodes into the brain and you potentially measure what people are thinking. Although, I need some more development, obviously. Scary thought. <coughs> yeah, so the basic problem here, um, fundamental problem of neuroscience, if you like, is though what, what we're implying with that is that, it's, well, first of all, it's an anatomical picture. 
this you don't really need a living animal to do that. There could be a dead animal. We say here's a retina, and then we have the the the, the, the LGN or the the, the the chiasm, which we say looks at the picture of the retina, and then then with the LGN looks at the picture of the um, the chiasm. We have the visual cortex looking at the picture of the LGN and the, the, the secondary cortex is presumably looking at the picture in the primary cortices. The problem here is obvious. Does this end? Who's looking? Who's, who's doing the looking? Is there something I in my brain that's doing the looking at any of that? To which the obvious answer is probably not. We, we, we discussed that already. In, in the first lecture of and th what we try to understand, what we have to understand is how the the consciousness, the I evolves as a function of the activity in the cortex, in the numerous cortices. This is just one, this is just where it goes in. But what happens actually um, if we involve more of these? And one thing that we have to understand in, in, in that is what's actually happening with the uh, with the information now coming back to our visual fields and our um, um, sensory areas from last week the first thing that if, if I asked you to draw a house and m almost every person in the world but even if they grew up in round houses <laughs> <laughs> might probably recognize this as a house although a house doesn't it, it, it actually nobody would tell you that they see an arrangement of horizontal and vertical lines that's my point but what your eye sees what your visual cortex sees is an arrangement of horizontal and vertical lines nothing else but you make it a house so th there's obviously a lot of experience involved in that um, and a lot of, of, of neural processing involved of that as well. First of all, the, the task is to actually detect these lines. And here's something that we do understand for a change, for a change, because it's very easy to make up these receptive fields that we were talking about. Yeah, remember that so the plus in the middle, minus at the at the outside. This comes from the from the um, from the cochlea, or, uh, cochlea from the from um, from the retina. We've got a few million of those. And we can play with them. We can arrange them in a number of ways. And if we arrange them, for example, so that three of these cells project on one cell, and uh, that these three cells have, have, have a receptive field that look like that, and the resulting receptive field would look like that. All the pluses are on top, and all the minuses to the left and the right. Why is that useful? Well, that's an edge detector, because if we put a now, not a spotlight like what we did last week, but we have a straight line. And if the straight line goes like that, we have a big activity. And if the straight line goes like that, it doesn't care. So this is how an edge detector can be constructed from these basic building blocks. Another example would be a motion detector that I haven't actually got a, le a, a, a slide for. Um, but it would be the same logic. You just need to capture them in time. First, second, third. And if they're going in this direction, you would detect a motion with that. And so on and so on. Um, so th we, we kind of understand the, 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 the fundamental um, on, a, on an abstract level. We're not talking real neurons here yet, but we're talking abstract receptive fields. Um, and we know that they will result in, for example, our edge detection. And what people have, have discovered now that's something um, Hubel and Wiesel in, in the 50s discovered is that these are very very highly arranged in the cortex and, and, and systematic almost in a crystal structure um, which is called um, cortical columns and I'm going to talk two minutes about the cortical columns because they seem to be something very useful for us to understand. First of all if we go through the, these cortical layers we already said at some point the cortex generally has six uh, structures that we can see. We can see them under a microscope because there are different kinds of neurons and different density of neurons. And what people know by now with a lot of research is that the, this is the top, yeah, this is the bottom, the LGN projects the axons in here, they go into layer um, three, no, four, 
one, two, three, four, five, six. This is where the, the, the information ends um, from the LGN. So the receptive fields in here would be pretty much exactly like the receptive fields in the LGN. And then it projects up to two and three. But here we have cross connections between different columns from different sites. And there we would then detect um, edges, for example. From there on, the, the information then goes up to the layer one and back to other layers and project out again. The point is that there is a lot, well, uh, th 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 a lot of points. The first point here is that this organization is throughout the cortex, everywhere on the cortex, pretty much repetitively the same. And every brain that we know that, uh, c that, that possesses a cortex has the, kind, the same kind of structure. And it's very repetitive, which means you don't need much information to do that, to build that. Here's another picture of explaining that a little bit more simply. The main, the principal cells, principal means main cells, and here are the pyramidal cells um, that, that, that get the, that, that sends the projection out into uh, descending nerve fibers. Um, the, the, the information comes in here in the, in the layer four, and then it goes into layer three. It goes left and right to other uh, columns next to each other. But why, why is that important? Because the theory is that many people follow, not everybody, there's a bit of a, a disagreement on that, is, but that these col columns, these are just one after the other, after the other, always doing the same thing. So you get information from LGN into level four, then it goes up and it goes down, but there is very little going on sideways. That's why they're called columns. So most of the information stream goes up and down and very little left right. Left right only at a specific point here um, in the um, in, in, in the layer two, three from other cells or out into other columns. Now and there has been a lot of research going on to understand these computational modules. Um, and we'll we will see that again because this is where all <coughs> the main research at the moment is actually going to understand these cortical columns a little bit more, although there is disagreement to the importance of those, which is a good sign in science if something is dis uh, r r not generally agreed upon, it means there is something interesting. Um, because there's not all animals actually show the same kind of structure, as I said, it's not that easy. It looks different in different animals, um, but there we go. The, the thing that we do know, in, in humans certainly, um, to bring back the orientation, and this is the, the work of Hubel and Wiesel, so this is pretty much textbook stuff, um, what the, how the orientations are actually represented. This is a ferret, but that would be pretty much the same for a human. And the technique here is called intrinsic optical imaging which is um, uh, in, in real time, you open the, the, the brain, preferably on a ferret now again, and the optical, um, the primary op um, optical cortex is very useful for that because it's just at the back of the head. So you can open up the skull, a few square millimeter, put a camera on top, and then you measure a specific wavelength which um, changes with the blood flow, so with the hemoglobin in the blood, and then you can do it in real time, you can measure which brain area is active. So this would be here, two, three, four, five, six, seven millimeters, seven by four. Um, and what this map represents, different colors, different um, represent different orientations. So all the red areas here represent stimuli that have a 45 degree angle. Blue, vertical, yellow, horizontal. So this is fascinating because it reveals a very fundamental um, way that, that that information is coded now. So this is not a column. A column is smaller than that. But each of these columns basically has one orientation. Okay, If it is one color, then it is basically one column. And neighboring columns have neighboring orientations, but different. Okay? fascinating thing in here as well, where all of these meet, there are some cases, some points there, there, and there, 
where all of these colours meet, like a rainbow, they are called pinwheels. There's a lot of theoretical work going on how this representation happens. We don't have to worry about that. We can understand that as a very fundamental principle how an outside information is represented in here. Orientation map. The other thing that we that we want to that I want to mention in that respect is um, the fact that we have two eyes because this these things interact with each other. That's the binocular vision. Uh, here just to represent the the difference between a rabbit and a human. For us, we can't see behind our head. We've got uh, two areas where we only see with one eye, and one area where we see with two. This obviously is the area where we can see three-dimensional. The, 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 the rabbit apparently can see three-dimensional behind his head, which might be quite useful if he's running away from a fox, because he actually sees the fox better if he's running away from it than it's on the site. But why do we have two eyes? Why do we have that area? What's the advantage? One I already mentioned can do three-dimensional sight, and the other one is you've got two eyes, so you've got two chances to see something. You can see better in the dark in that area. Okay. Uh, yeah, here's a little experiment. You've got a piece of paper. I want you to do that yourself. I've got a little piece of paper here. And that experiment, it goes like that. You roll a piece of paper into a into a little roll and you hold it um, about this size away from you and you look around yourself. The experiment is called shooting a hole because you do that and you look around, look at some focus at something far away, not on your hand, but you focus on something further away. Look at somebody, look at me and describe what you see on your hand. What happens to your hand? They do that next to each other, not that far away, and, and about um, um, well half a meter away from you. You, don't, you can't s no, you don't stretch it quite as far, just like that. Are we just seeing one eye? No, no. We, no. Watch, we, we watch both eyes. Uh, both eyes open. No. The experiment is calling shooting a hole because it, it demonstrates. Oh, okay that the cortex is doing the best of the available information. This is obviously not a situation that a cortex usually finds itself in. <laughs> but what you, what you, what you <laughs> should see, what, what do you see? Can you describe it in your own words? A hole in my hand. You have a hole in your hand, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> is it bleeding? <laughs> they're next to each other, so that, that, that they're just about touching. So you, you're trying to watch through your hand. With your left eye, you're trying to watch through your hand. With your right eye, you're looking through your binocular. Yeah? And you should see... <laughs> you should see me through your hand. Which is... Which is obviously not a very useful thing. Obviously, your brain is doing an error here. Yeah? It's an optical illusion. But why is the brain doing that? Because it makes the best available guess of the situation, giving the evidence that it has. And the evidence here is skewed because you, 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 you're not doing what you usually do, namely overlaying two pictures, but you're overlaying one picture that is unusual with another picture that through, through, through the whole. So this, this is an, uh, throws a light on, on, on the well creativity of the cortex of making the best available, um, best as it can to paint a single scene. And that's binocular fusion. So you fuse the two, two eyes. The, the you need to, to realize that you have two images, two independent images. You've got two eyes. It's not one image. You've got two images, two retinas, and they both are fused together by the brain. It's actually an active process to fuse these two together. If a baby grows up with a, with a problem in that, and people, uh, babies for example, that have a, 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 what is it called, if they look into two different eyes, uh, it's, it's d d d into two different di directions, they will not learn that fusion. 
and they will never be able to fuse and to see three dimensional. Um, but again, our receptive fields are very clever way of explaining how that works. You know that, I mean, what, what's actually the situation? You've got the two eyeballs, you've got um, three dimension for the three dimension, you need to know A is in front of B, and the information that you have available, if you only had one eye, that eye, you just see A here and B there. You cannot, there's not enough information to make anything out of that, obviously. You know, if you close one eye, it's hard to estimate uh, how far something is away. You can still do it. Interesting question, why can you still do it? experience because you know how far things are away but I can put you into a situation where you don't know how far things are away and you would fail with one eye that's easy to show but with two eyes you've got not only two visions or two situations you've got two different situations you see that the angle here is different from the angles here and this is used in 3d cinema obviously where you have either shutter eyes or you have left uh, left and, and, and green eyes and what, 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 what happens is that depending, for example, here's a little sketch, uh, depending on how these two colors, the red and the cyan, how far they're away from each other, the, the, the cloud here, for example, they're further away from each other, and if you were looking through glasses like that, you would see that as further away, because these are, 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 are further away from each other than, say, the tree, where the tree is closest because it has well, they're overlapping. And the receptive fields can explain that very easily again because you've got two receptive fields but in fact you need a lot of receptive fields um, and each combination of differences between A and B the distance requires a different receptive field but you just need to look for um, let's say the, 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 well, the, the, the cloud so you've got ocular columns active here and here and that would be the blue one and the red one and if they come together your brain knows ah there's something that far away so this is all fairly linear if you like you've got these receptive fields you can play around with them you can combine them you can do fantastic stuff you can now th th this is the, th th the finishing um, words on that you can combine our functional maps of, of, of the brain here, of that's called the ocular dominance stripes, so the left eye and the right eye are represented on the cortex in different areas, so here on, on the, all of the, they're always in, look like a zebra, so 50% is represented, the, the left eye, 50% is ref representing the right eye, and each of those, the same part of the cortex, each of those represents a different orientation. And here's another picture of how we can imagine that. So we combine the orientation with the left and the right and the left and the right and the left and the right. And this way we get to more and more complex. We've got orientation, we've got uh, left eye, right eye. We can add other things like color, for example, uh, in, in there. And we, we, we can see that each of these blocks, of it, uh, they're called then the ocular columns, is interested in just one of these features. So now we've got another representation sort of a more abstract representation of, the, of, of what's happening in the outside world and we need to find the looker who's, who's looking at that ok that's all very interesting um, some, some tidbits of information for that um, that has been shown by Hubel and Wiesel as I said 50 years ago one really interesting experiment that has been done to, to show uh, what was the, the relevance of these is that they put poor kittens a different guy, not, not who blended, I actually forgot the name of the person who, who, who did that they raised kittens in cages that only had horizontal or only visual um, vertical stripes so the, the cells were never exposed to stripes of a different direction I mean unless the cat tilts their eyes but obviously that doesn't happen that often so the, the overwhelming um, majority of the representation were either horizontal in this case or vertical because this is what they, what they were brought up with what, what the point that I'm making w w with that or with that experiment is that this is not uh, born you're not born with these um, fields and these representations because but they need to be learned from outside stimuli 
So the, the, the environment in which you grow up determines what your cortex looks like, how these specific patterns look like, and they look different in every animal and every person, obviously. And if you only look at, 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 at horizontal or vertical lines all of your life, you wouldn't have the green and the yellow ones, you would only have the blue ones. If you only look with your left eye, you wouldn't have a, red, a right eye representation. Um, so there's a very simple way of saying we've got information coming in, the cortex somehow adjusts to that and represents and learns to represent that representation. And what happens with these poor kittens? Well, what, what they would see is a simulation. Here's a building, I think it's a college in Oxford. And the, if, if the, kittens, the kittens wouldn't have vertical rep, um, re, um, stripe representation, this is what they would see, the horizontal, this is what they would see. So obviously we need a combination of both. Yes. No, funnily, not. There is a high plasticity, but in this case, they were it was shown that they will not uh, relearn the other representation. So the, the brain is plastic. The cortex can learn a lot of new things, but some fundamental things, if they're set, they're set, and they wouldn't be relearned. There is a taking over element. Um, might actually talk about that when we talk about uh, the, the, the implantations. Uh, people that become blind later on in their life, obviously a huge part of their brain isn't used anymore, that will take be taken over mostly by the auditory areas. The, the, the whole crux of the thing is that um, the cortex doesn't know if something is sound or vision or horizontal or vertical or whatnot. It's just doing s the same thing. Um, it, it somehow processes information and one c area of the brain can do the same thing as other areas of the brain. There's been a very um, mind-boggling experiment been done on that to, to show how plastic the brain is, namely in tadpoles. At the very early stage you can just remove an eye and implant it into a different tadpole. And then these tadpoles have three three eyes. Google three-eyed frog, if you don't believe me. But this is the thing. <laughs> There's quite a number of experiments going on with that. Now, the the, the two-eyed frog, obviously, but the frog doesn't it, it care about three-dimensional vision. Uh, you actually Google three-eyed frog. Do that. <laughs> um, There's some interesting pictures out there. Um, but why why do people do that? Apart from uh, obviously a bit crazy is that you can learn something about the brain. The, the two-eyed frog doesn't care about three-dimensional vision, so it doesn't need a representation where the left eye and the, red eye, uh, the right eye is um, interleaved, because it doesn't need to integrate left and, red, left and right eye. A three-eyed tadpole would have the option of looking three-dimensional through here. And this is exactly what happens in the cortex it suddenly develops, well, cortex doesn't have a cortex, the equivalent of the cortex in a frog, I forgot what it's called, um, will develop cortical structures. So just as a result of the different input, the cortex develops completely different. And I bet that this frog thinks it's completely normal to have three eyes, because this is what it grows up with, and it makes total sense, optimal sense of all the information available. Why can't it be 3D with two eyes? I don't, uh, it doesn't. I don't know why they don't do that, but they don't have the uh, the crossing from the left and the right. Good question. But they just don't. They don't, don't need to, I suppose. I think they just their hunting behaviour just doesn't require it because yeah. they just have a long tongue and they see something there and they flick out their tongue and if they reach it, good, and yeah. if they don't reach it. <laughs> so with a three, with a third eye, does still only need one? Does the visual area of the back of whatever brain they have, like, accommodate the third eye? Yeah, that's what, it's, what, what I mean here. That's what it's shown. You've got the, the representation of these two eyes, and it's, it's, which hasn't got a third color in here. Light and dark, and then suddenly the stripes they interleave, so they they do create columns that haven't been there before. So that the eye becomes represented. 
Now, did you find some pictures of the three eyed fox? Can you show them? <laughs> I found one that I didn't think was real because it's not got three eyes. It's got one. Yeah, it's got, it's got one. one. <laughs> That's what came up when I turned into three eyes. <laughs> Interesting. There's yeah. So the take home message is stimulate your baby because the more stimulation they get. Here we go. <laughs> but there have been all sorts of these experiments because you can you can swap the auditory with the visual nerve, for example. The cortex doesn't bother. They will still hear or see. Sli maybe slightly different, but they, they, the cortex doesn't make the most information out of that. That's why we talk about enriching early experience. The more babies see and hear and feel and what's that, it stimulates their brain and makes the right connections. Yes, um, don't go into that. This is the motion sensitivity. Now, one of the take home messages of this whole module is that I don't want to. I will leave now the, the textbook to, to the dismay of our psychologist students. I will leave the textbook psychology, brain surgery or brain uh, neuroscience behind me and will go into what we are actually, what I think and what people think where we are going with neuroscience. And the most um, interesting area of research in that is represented by this Blue Brain Project. Anybody has heard about the Blue Brain Project? Probably not. Okay. Um, it started by a guy called um, Henry Markart, who we will see now here in a, in a TED talk. Talking about a brain and supercomputer. This is a, just, just three words to, 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 to kick that off. Um, he, he's pretty well known neuroscientist, um, lives in Switzerland, Lausanne, and we have no sound in here. make it big in a minute. So Blue Brain it's called because they bought the IBM Blue. Do you have heard of that? This one was one of the main supercomputers 2005-2006 fastest computer then. Not anymore uh, but this is just the tool that they're using. We'll talk about that in a second. And we have all of the tools now available to understand what he's talking about because he's talking about columns, about cortical columns and how to simulate them and um, they got from the EU one billion pounds in 2012 to build that. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about thousands of people on the level of, of NASA moon landing of where neuroscience, the way that, that, that neuroscience works today. It's not the guy with the lab coat discovering interesting things but it's thousand people across Europe spending a billion pounds on We've done in the computers. past four years a proof of concept on a small part, part of the rodent brains and with this proof of concept we are now scaling the project up to reach the human brain. Why are we doing this? There's three important reasons. The first is <coughs> it's essential for us to understand the human 2009 brain. 2009 it started. Do want to the get talk is from 2013. And I think uh, that this is a key step in evolution. And the second uh, reason is we cannot keep doing animal experimentation forever. And we have to embody all our data and all our knowledge into a working model. It's like a Noah's Ark, it's like an archive. And the third reason is that there are two billion people on the planet that are affected by mental disorder. And the drugs that are used today are largely empirical. And I think that we can come up with very concrete solutions how to treat disorders. Now, even at this stage, we can use the brain model to explore some fundamental questions about how the brain works. 
And here at TED, for the first time, I'd like to share with you how we're addressing one theory. There are many theories. One theory, how the brain works. So this theory is that the brain creates, builds, a version of the universe and projects this version of the universe like a bubble all around us. Now this is of course a topic of philosophical debate for centuries, but for the first time we can actually address this with brain simulation and ask very systematic and rigorous questions whether this theory could possibly be true. The reason why the moon is huge on the horizon is simply because our perceptual bubble does not stretch out 380,000 kilometers. It runs out of space. And so what we do is we compare the buildings within our perceptual bubble and we make a decision. We make a decision it's that big, even though it's not that big. And what that illustrates is that decisions are the key things that support our perceptual bubble. It keeps it alive. Without decisions, you cannot see, you cannot think, you cannot feel. And you may think that anesthetics work by sending you into some deep sleep or by blocking your receptors so that you don't feel pain. But in fact, most anesthetics don't work that way. What they do is they introduce a noise into the brain so that the neurons cannot con understand each other. They're confused. And you cannot make a decision. So while you're trying to make up your mind what the doctor, the surgeon is doing while he's hacking away at your body, he's long gone. He's at home having tea. So when you walk up to a door and you open it, what you compulsively have to do to perceive is to make decisions. Thousands of decisions about the size of the room, the walls, the height, the objects in this room. 99% of what you see is not what comes in through the eyes. It is what you infer about that room. So I can say with some certainty, I think, therefore I am. But I cannot say, you think, therefore you are. Because you are within my perceptual bubble. Now, we can speculate and philosophize this, and, but we don't actually have to for the next hundred years. We can ask very concrete questions. Can the brain build such a perception? Is it capable of doing it? Does it have the substance to do it? And that's what I'm going to describe to you today. So, it took the universe 11 billion years to build a brain. It had to improve it a little bit. It had to add to the frontal part so that you would have instincts because they had to cope on land. But the real big step was the neocortex. It's a new brain. You needed it. The mammals needed it because they had to cope with parenthood, social interactions, complex cognitive functions. So you can think of the neocortex actually as the ultimate solution today of the universe as we know it. It's the pinnacle. It's the final product that the universe has produced. It was so successful in evolution that from mouse to man it expanded about a thousand fold in terms of the numbers of neurons to produce this almost frightening organ structure. And it has not stopped its evolutionary path. In fact, the human neocortex and the human brain is evolving at an enormous speed. If you zoom in onto the surface of the neocortex, you discover that it's made up of little modules, G5 processes, like in a computer, but there's Columns. about a million of them. That's one column. They were so successful in evolution that what we did was to duplicate them over and over and add more and more of them to the brain until we ran out of space in the skull and the brain started to fold in on itself. And that's why the neocortex is so highly convoluted. We were just packing in columns so that we'd have more neocortical columns to perform more complex functions. So you can think of the neocortex actually as a massive grand piano, million key grand piano. Each of these neocortical columns would produce a note. You stimulate it, it produces a symphony. But it's not just a symphony of perception. It's a symphony of your universe, your reality. Now, of course, it takes years to learn how to master a grand piano with a million keys. 
That's why you have to send your kids to good schools and hopefully eventually to Oxford. But it's not only education. It's also genetics, and you may be born lucky, where you know how to master your neocortical column, and you can play a fantastic symphony. In fact, there's a new theory of autism called the intense world theory, which suggests that the neocortical columns are super columns. They're highly reactive and they're super plastic. And so the, the autists are probably uh, capable of building and learning a symphony which is unthinkable for us. But you can also understand that if you have a disease within one of these columns, the note is going to be off. The perception, the symphony that you create is going to be corrupted and you will have symptoms of disease. So the holy grail for neuroscience is really to understand the design of the neocortical column. And it's not just for neuroscience, it's perhaps to understand perception, to understand reality, and perhaps to even also understand physical reality. So what we did was, for the past 15 years, was to dissect out the neocortex systematically. It's a bit like going and cataloging a piece of the rainforest. How many trees does it have? What shapes are the trees? How many of each type of tree do you have? Where are they positioned? But it's a bit more than cataloging because you actually have to describe and discover all the rules of communication, the rules of connectivity, because the neurons don't just like to connect with any neuron. They choose very carefully who they connect with. It's also more than cataloging because you actually have to build three-dimensional digital models of them. And we did that for tens of thousands of neurons, built digital models of all the different types of neurons we came across. And once you have that, you can actually begin to build the neocortical column. And here we're calling them up. But as you do this, what you see is that the branches intersect actually in millions of locations. And at each of these intersections, they can form a synapse and the synapse is a chemical location where they can communicate with each other. And these synapses together form the network or the circuit of the brain. Now, the circuit you could also think of as the fabric of the brain. And when you think of the fabric of the brain, the structure, how is it built? What's the pattern of the carpet? you realize that this poses a fundamental challenge to any theory of the brain. And especially to a theory that says that there's some uh, reality that emerges out of this carpet, out of this particular carpet with a particular pattern. The reason is because the most important design secret of the brain is diversity. Every neuron is different. It's the same in the forest. Every pine tree is different. You may have many different types of trees, but every pine tree is different. And in the brain it's the same. So there's no neuron in my brain that's the same as another, and there's no neuron in my brain that's the same as in yours. And your neurons are not going to be oriented and positioned in exactly the same way, and you may have more or less neurons. So it's very unlikely that you've got the same fabric, the same circuitry. So how could we possibly create a reality that we can even understand each other? Well, we don't have to speculate. We can look at all 10 million synapses now. We can look at the fabric. And we can change neurons. We can use different neurons with different variations. We can position them in different places, orient them in different places. We can use less or more of them. And when we do that, what we discovered is that the circuitry does change. But the pattern of how the circuitry is designed does not. So the fabric of the brain, even though your brain may be smaller, bigger, it may have different types of neurons, uh, different uh, morphologies of neurons, we actually do share the same fabric. And we think this is species specific, which means that that could explain why we can't communicate across species. So let's switch it on, but to do it, what you have to do is you have to make this come alive. We make it come alive with equations, a lot of mathematics. And in fact, the equations that make neurons into electrical generators were discovered by two Cambridge Nobel laureates. So we have the mathematics to make neurons come alive. We also have the mathematics to describe how neurons collect information and how they create a little lightning bolt to communicate with each other. And when they get to the synapse, what they do is they effectively literally shock the synapse 
it's like electrical shock that releases the chemicals from these synapses and we've got the mathematics to describe this process so we can describe the communication between the neurons so there literally are only a handful of equations that you need to simulate the activity of the neocortex but what you do need is a very big computer and in fact you need one laptop to do all the calculations just for one neuron so you need 10,000 laptops so where do you go? you go to IBM and you get a supercomputer because they now have to take 10,000 laptops and put it into the size of a refrigerator. So now we have this blue gene supercomputer. We can load up all the neurons, onto each one onto its processor, and fire it up and see what happens. Take the magic carpet for a ride. Here we activate it and this gives the first glimpse of what is happening in your brain when there is a stimulation. It's the first view. Now, when you look at that the first time, you think, my God, how is reality coming out of that? But in fact, you can start, even though we haven't trained this neocortical column to create a specific reality, but we can ask, where is the rose? We can ask, where is it inside? If we stimulate it with a picture. Where is it inside the neocortex? Ultimately, it's got to be there if we stimulated it with it. So the way that we can look at that is to ignore the neurons, ignore the synapses, and look just at the raw electrical activity, because that's what it's creating. It's creating electrical patterns. So when we did this, we indeed, for the first time, saw these ghostly-like structures, electrical objects appearing within the neocortical column. And it's these electrical objects that are holding all the information about whatever stimulated it. And then when we zoomed into this, it's like a veritable universe. So the next step is just to take these brain coordinates and to project them into perceptual space. And if you do that, you would be able to step inside the reality that is created by this machine, by this piece of the brain. So, in summary, I think that the universe may have, it's possible, has evolved the brain to see itself, which may be a first step in being, becoming aware of itself. There's a lot more to do to test these theories and to test any other theories, but I'm, I hope that you're at least partly convinced that it is not impossible to build the brain, and we can do it within 10 years. And if we do succeed, we will send to TED in 10 years a hologram to talk to you. Thank you. Why do I show you that? To show you where science is going. It's away from one lab, it's going into massive collaborations of people, thousands of people huge supercomputers. They need one supercomputer to simulate one column. One column, of which we have 100 million in the, in the brain. So he's very optimistic and he says the same thing. He said 10 years ago, in 10 years we will have simulated the human brain. They have taken their, 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 their a little bit down. They're trying to simulate a rat's brain now within 10 years, but they're getting there. And uh, the, read up, Google it, um, th th find a lot of videos from this. He actually gives about the same TED Talks every year, but he always updates it a little bit um, of what, what, what they have done. And there's very good research coming out of that and a big a, a, and better understanding of the columns, of the, um, the, the processing in the columns that ever has been there before. That's for, sh for, for sure. Where the whole thing guides, and, and he has mentioned that a number of times, is you've got simple rules a handful of equations that make up complex systems and this is what we will talk about next week in more detail how simplicity in everywhere in nature becomes complexity which for me is one of the most fascinating things in the universe how complexity evolves and the brain is one structure where we can study that very in, in very good detail Okay, so you remember who didn't fall asleep? What did he call the holy grail of neuroscience? <laughs> the part. He
he actually set the understanding of the <coughs> column, of the single column. But it will be obviously the understanding of the neocortex. But it, they, they, they seem to believe when you have an understanding of the, of the, of the one column and you put them together, again, you've got a more complex system with simple rules, you will create um, um, complexity. What is the goal of neuroscience in general? That's a very good question. Um, I'll leave that to, to, to ponder about that, what we're actually trying to do. Is it understanding the brain? Is it understanding consciousness? Is it creating a brain? What he didn't talk about in this talk is that what they're actually doing, and one of their outputs is to build computers that function like the brain, so that simulate cortical structures. And the goal of that is to create a completely different way of computing things like the human brain, not with zero and ones, but with association with um, all the things that we know from the brain. Right, got a little bit of time. Can you go to this web page? That's your task today. Sorry, yeah. Can they process if each one is unique to its orientation? Yeah. And as you said, it could go on to color and everything. Yep. But does that mean they process just one part of an object? Yeah. Not the whole. That is exactly what one of these exercises is about. But I've got a little picture here that I did actually skip about. We think of this always in a hierarchical way. What we talked about here, this is the retinal representation. These are these, these orientation columns that we talked about. So this is one <coughs> column. This is another column. There's another column, another column, another column. And they're all connected with each other. So the simple case, we've got simple representation, color, uh, orientation, sound, frequency, whatever you can think of. Combine them and you get something more complex. You get this one here that likes the combination of these two. And combine them again and you get more complex things. I mean, this is a little bit abstract, but it's, 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 um, it leads to the concept of the grandmother cell. Have you heard that concept? which was for, for 50 years was actually derided. The, the, the concept is, have you got a cell in your brain that responds only when your grandmother, when you think of your grandmother, you see her? People always th use that as an example of, of ridicule, the idea, the grandmother cell, and, and saying that wasn't there. But it turns out that there is <laughs> probably a grandmother column somewhere, <laughs> namely cells that have been found in, in the macaque here. Uh, it's called face cells that obviously are very complex. So they are not any more based on, on columns, but on a lot of, uh, sorry, not on, on, on orientation, but on a lot of orientation and other features that all go together and create a face. And this cell, for example, likes a face. If you arrange these things in a different way, it doesn't like it. If you present a different face to it, it will like it. If you present a hand, will not like it, even if it has maybe the same kind of orientations and colors and whatnot in there. So there is, the higher you go, the more complex the, 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 the features become that the cells or the columns respond to. That's exactly what the, what the, what the exercise is about, to understand um, three kinds. I'll show you how, how that works, maybe here. You can have a go at it yourself. Perceiving and recognizing, it's called, uh, no, it's not the, that's the first one, the pandemonium. We've got demons, We've got feature demons, they're the ones that we were talking about. They're orientation sensitive. Yeah, this demon, think of it as one neuron, it's one column, sits and sleeps at the moment because it doesn't appear anything in its visual field. But let's put something in its visual field, like the R. Ah. Here we go. Now they wake up, they're happy, because they see something, these are very clearly inside their visual field. That one is kind of lucky, happy, but not so much. And this one gets the information from all of these and says, yeah, there's an R, probably. There's a cognitive demon, so one above. And the one, the decision demon, which is maybe the prefrontal kind of the cortex, says, yeah, there's an R, and it's, it, it's sure about it, because it is an exclamation mark behind it. Okay? Do that yourself, and go through the, the text on the left, and, and, and click on all of these, and see that the question that you're supposed to answer me now is, um, how does a decision demon distinguish an H from a T? 
that's your job. And the other job is what principle make you interpret the wheels, windows and body of a passing car as part of the same object? Question number one. Get out your laptops. Go to this page.